There are over 350 million Buddhists in the world. And while many think that Buddhism is a religion that teaches how to find inner peace and nirvana, it also teaches that it's an impossible quest. Around the world, 350 million Buddhists are striving for one thing, nirvana. When one reaches nirvana, it all ends there. The person has been extinguished. In Buddhism, there is no creator, no supreme god, and no salvation but yourself. I was taught that you are your own strength. You have to achieve your own glory and achieve spiritual improvement by yourself. To reach nirvana is to extinguish the self, a nearly impossible task. In my opinion, reaching nirvana seems a hopeless situation. More than 2,000 years ago, a nobleman named Siddhartha Gautama went on a quest to overcome suffering and death. Through self-discipline and meditation, he believed that he had finally achieved nirvana. After that, he became known as the Buddha, or Enlightened One. Buddha claimed that he had found the cause of human suffering and the way to end it. He then laid out his four noble truths. All existence is suffering. Human desire or attachment causes this suffering. Humans can end suffering by putting an end to their selfish desires. The fourth truth says that the only way to achieve nirvana is to follow the Eightfold Path, a series of mental and behavioral guidelines. This path is illustrated by the Dharma Wheel, one of the most important symbols of Buddhism. It represents the endless cycle of life through rebirth. The wheel is divided into three sections, wisdom, ethical conduct, and mental development. For Buddhist monks, Following the path demands that they leave everything behind, even their families, to focus on perfecting themselves. People who really want to achieve nirvana need to remove themselves from society and leave everything in order to keep their minds and soul peaceful. Therefore, the ones who have achieved nirvana are mostly monks. After entering monkhood, there are 227 rules that need to be followed. Those who want to achieve nirvana need to meditate at all times. One cannot allow his feelings or emotions to overtake them. The soul needs to be pure and free from any emotion or sadness. That person's soul needs to be pure, bright and peaceful all the time. Only then can he achieve nirvana. And there's no supreme God to help you achieve nirvana. In Buddhism, the fate of your soul depends entirely on you. Each of us has our own responsibility, and each of us does suffer because of our confusion. But if we come to understand, there is, we can free ourselves from suffering even in this life, much less waiting for someone else to do it for us anytime. And if you don't get it right in this life, Buddhists believe there's always the next. The cyclic existence is a process of rebirths in order for each soul to make amends for their bad karma, all the karma that one has built up during a lifetime. If one kills and eats an animal, that person will be born as an animal during his next life. The chances for a soul to be born as a human being in order to improve their spirituality their karma, and be able to achieve nirvana are very slim. It is very hard. Buddha's whole teaching was is that there is no separated self. It's a hard road because you realize 
that ultimately you can't really have nirvana until all beings have nirvana. So then that makes it really tough. It is a tough way. How, how do you perfect yourself? How, how do you do enough good things to make up for all the bad things that you've done? How can you possibly have a, a, even a moment when you are perfect? The Buddhists think that, well, okay, if I'm not going to get it right, there's always the next time, uh, and then the time after that, and they project it out into an infinity where all beings, all sentient beings, uh, achieve nirvana together. Well, what does the Bible say about reincarnation? You find it in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once. Once. Uh, we get one, one lifetime. We don't get multiple ones. And then it adds, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Uh, and the writer of Hebrews is making a very important point. God, God didn't have to sacrifice Jesus again and again. Christ was appointed to die for us once, and he did it for the sins of all humans for all time. And he did it because he realized and he knew that we can't get there. Uh, we can't observe enough laws. We can't uh, perfect ourselves. We can't make up for the sin that stains us and separates us from him. So he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And you find the prayer and you find the promise in the Old Testament. You find it in Psalm 79. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why did good God do it? Well, he did it for his own name's sake. He understood that we are, our, uh, he, we are his children, and he loves us with an infinite love. For God so loved the world, and that means you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and you can be a whosoever, would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. God took care of it. He took care of our problems so that we could be reconciled to him for all eternity. Now, the Buddhists say, well, that's a shortcut. Well, yeah, it is, and it's a great one. And this great news of salvation needs to be proclaimed in all the world as a witness, and then the end will come. That's the great promise of the church, the great promise of salvation that God has taken care of it. Why? For his own name's sake. Terry, over to you.